it does not feel like a labor at all to preach the word to you. Uh, we were standing there singing. I was thinking of Psalm 126. I think it is. Uh, when the Lord restored the fortunes of Zion, we were like those who dreamed. Our mouth is filled with laughter, tongue with a shout of joy. Then it was said among the nations, the Lord has done great things for them. Then the people of God say, the Lord has done great things for us, and we are filled with joy. It's great joy and honor to bring the word to you again. Let me say as well before I begin, I didn't mention this earlier. Two weeks ago, uh, brother Eric Abuao, his wife Judita, their four children, Mitch, James, Wendo, and Quay, came and preached uh, at my church. So I was able to see them only two weeks ago. And uh, I know you all miss them. Uh, it's a great, it was a great gift to see them. They love you still so much, uh, but it's also a joy to be in the States and to see what the Lord is doing through their ministry there to bring about the obedience that comes from faith among all nations for the sake of Christ's name. If you could open in your Bibles to Revelation 5. In many ways, Revelation 4, if, if we were to think of this vision, the second vision, as a, a drama, a play, in many ways, as, as amazing as it is to say, Revelation 4 is simply the scenery, simply setting the stage. And then suddenly Revelation 5, and the drama unfolds. So let us pick up in Revelation 5, verse 1. Holy Scripture says, Then I saw in the right hand of him who is sitting upon the throne a scroll written within and on the back, sealed with seven seals. And I saw a mighty angel proclaiming with a loud voice, Who is worthy to open the scroll and break its seals? And no one, heaven, on earth, under the earth, was able to open the scroll or to look into it. And I began to weep loudly because no one was found worthy to open the scroll or to look inside. And one of the elders said to me, stop weeping. Look. The lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has conquered so that he can open the scroll and its seven seals. And between the throne and the four living creatures and among the elders, I saw a lamb standing as one who had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. And he came and took the scroll from the right hand of him who was seated on the throne. And when he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the land, each holding a harp and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sang, a new song saying, Worthy are you to take the scroll and to open its seals because you were slain, you were slaughtered, and by your blood you ransomed a people for God from every tribe and language and people and nation, and you have made them a kingdom and priests for our God, and they shall reign upon the earth. And I, I looked. And I heard around the throne and the living creatures and the elders the voice of many angels, numbering myriads of myriads and thousands of thousands, saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. And I heard every creature in heaven and upon the earth and under the earth and in the sea and all that is in them saying to him who sits upon the throne and to the lamb be blessing and honor and glory and might forever and ever. And the four living creatures said, Amen. 
the elders fell down and worshipped. Let's ask for God's help. Our great God, we come boldly before your throne once more. With confidence. Because we know our priest king sits at your right hand. Because we know you are the one who justifies, who can condemn. You are for us, O God. Your sovereign supremacy I pray, O oh God, that you would strengthen me to preach your word and nothing else. Cursed, you tell us, is the one who adds to this word or takes away from it. So grant me grace to be faithful. And grant these dear brothers and sisters grace to hear, to receive. And may your spirit bring forth the fruit of obedience in their lives for the sake of Jesus' name. It's in his name we pray. Amen. On Friday, uh, Brother Ronald took us into downtown Nairobi. And uh, we, we stopped several places. But the one place I want to speak about this afternoon is uh, the American Embassy Memorial Garden. I think I have the name right. Uh, it's the memorial from the 1998 terrorist attack. Uh, it's a strange thing. You're in the middle of the city. You walk into this park. And then you learn what happened there. Shattered glass, bloodied streets, ruin and death. As an American, it, seeing the images of that day reminded me of uh, a similar day three years later, 9-11. I remember visiting the ruin in New York City. When we came into the Memorial Center, a guide met us. And he began to speak about peace. Peace among the nations. He, he had us sit on you know, a circular couch, and there were proverbs around the couch about peace. On the wall in front of us, there was quotations from philosophers, from poets, even from the Pope. All about peace. All about peace among the nations. But the irony was the blind pride that inhabited that place. The foolish belief that we can achieve peace. That's what all the quotes were about. From Dr. King. I'm trying to remember who else was on the wall. But there was Kenyans. There was Americans. We, 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 humanity can achieve peace. If we would just try a bit more. Learn a bit harder. Listen a bit more carefully. But of all the human leaders and philosophers quoted on that wall, what man or woman among them has achieved a lasting peace? What poet or proverb written on a wall has quelled the nations raging by their so-called wisdom and talk of peace? This park built upon the ruins of this brutal attack should be clear evidence that man cannot achieve Man cannot quell his own rebellion or the nation's raging. Man cannot end evil, raise the dead, restore the ruins, or make all things new. And to live, to act, to believe like we can is to be deceived and blinded by idolatry. The book of Revelation is clear. It's one of the comforts of this book. It's so true. It's like Ecclesiastes. There's no hiding in the book of Revelation the kind of world we live in. We live in the kind of world where embassies are bombed, where the wicked prosper, where man talks about peace but cannot achieve it because he doesn't really want to look away from his own strength, his own wisdom, his own reflection in the mirror. We live amid the ruins, longing for someone, anyone, to save us, to restore us, to comfort us, to make all things new. We might be tempted as Christians to go to a place like that and live by only what our eyes can see. And if we were to go to that memorial garden and live only by what our eyes can see, if we were to read our newspapers or, or turn on the TV and watch the news, 
I don't know how you perceive the war between Russia and Ukraine. I won't go into it. But as a Westerner, World War II was supposed to be the end of wars in Europe. Here we are again. We might be tempted to think that the ruins will never be restored, that peace will never be achieved, that the tears will never be wiped away, that the thing, that all things will never be made new. But this afternoon, we come to Revelation 5. This morning in Revelation 4, we heard through John's symbolic vision of heaven that there is a sovereign and eternal God who sits and reigns over the flood. We ended in Revelation 4 celebrating this God, not only because he created all things, but because he sustains all things by his will, because of his will. And what we need to understand as we end Revelation 4 is God's will is not purposeless. We're not supposed to read Revelation 4.11 and think God is, God's will is like a car without a driver. Yeah, the engine is on, but there's, there's no direction. There's no goal. God's will in Revelation 4.11, God created and God sustains because from before the beginning, he has intended the end. That's why Revelation calls him the first and the last, the alpha and the omega. From Genesis 1 and before, he promised Revelation 22 and beyond. From the seeds of the garden, God always intended a perfected creation, renewed, restored, glorified. But the question that comes to us, as we get to Revelation 5, is how will God consummate the plan? How will he fully and finally fulfill what he has promised? How will the seeds that were planted in Eden's rich soil finally bear fruit? The answer, Revelation 5, it's no surprise, we just sang it, we just read it. The answer centers upon a symbolic lamb, whom we know represents our Lord Jesus Christ. Here's the main message of Revelation 5. It's a little bit long as a main message, but each part, I think, is important. With the Father, our Lord Jesus Christ deserves all worship. Two reasons. Because he redeemed us by his death and now reigns to consummate God's plan. Let me read that one more time. With the Father, our Lord Jesus Christ deserves total worship, all worship, because he redeemed us by his death and now reigns to consummate God's plan. I'm going to use that word consummate many times. I trust you understand what it means. Consummate means to, to bring to completion, to fulfill. There's a reason the Bible ends with a wedding feast. I'm going to take this message in two parts. If, if you were to look at Revelation 5, four times John says, I saw, I saw, I saw, I saw. He's, he's telling us there, here's the, the sections of the vision. Verse 1, I saw. Verse 2, I saw. Verse 6, I saw. Verse 11, I saw and heard. We'll combine those four into two. In verses 1 to 5, we're simply asking the question we just sang, who is worthy? And then in verses 6 to 14, we simply hear the answer. The Lamb is worthy. Let's read verses 1 to 5 again. Look there with me. And I saw on the right hand of the one who is sitting upon the throne a scroll, written within and on the back, sealed with seven seals. And I saw a mighty angel proclaiming with a loud voice, Who is worthy to open the scroll and to break its seals? And no one was able in heaven or upon the earth nor under the earth to open the scroll or to see inside it. And I was weeping, wailing loudly because no one was found worthy to open the scroll or to see inside. And one of the elders said to me, stop weeping. Look, the lion from Judah's tribe, the root of David has conquered. So that or with the result that he can open the scroll and its seven seals. Verse 1, John continues to recount his vision to us. The spotlight remains fixed upon heaven's throne. 
central still is the sovereign and eternal God. But then in verse 1, as we begin to read, the, the spotlight on the stage shifts ever so slightly from the one who is sitting upon the throne to his right hand. And even more specifically, to an object in his right hand. It's a scroll or a book. It's written on both sides to symbolize that this scroll contains its author's full and final plan. There's, there's no part two that's somehow missing. Everything's here. And it's sealed with seven seals to communicate not only that it's completely sealed, but also that the one who opens it will reveal all that's written inside. There's no tricks. There's no hidden parts. Once the seals are opened, the scroll is able to be read and fulfilled. What is this scroll? When we were traveling in downtown Nairobi, I saw a Coca-Cola sign. I live two hours east of Atlanta. Coca-Cola's headquarters is in Atlanta. I didn't even have to see the sign, right? I, I see the colors out of the corner of my eye. I see the way the letters are written. And right away, what do I know? Coca-Cola, I know what this is. Same thing should happen when we come to this scroll. We ought to see this scroll... And as we grow in our understanding of the Old Testament, as we read our Old Testaments more and more, just like when I see the, the colors of Coca-Cola and the writing, I immediately know what it is. When we see this scroll, Old Testament should start to be coming into our minds and into our hearts. Remember the scroll in Ezekiel 2-3. to Ezekiel tells us this scroll had writing on the front and on the back. And there were written on it words of lamentation and mourning and woe. In other words, this scroll in Ezekiel was the word of the Lord that proclaimed the full extent, the full scope of Judah's coming judgment. Remember the sealed book in Isaiah 29. Though the Lord had clearly declared that he would both judge and save, Judah's unbelief and idolatry made Isaiah's vision, we read in Chapter 29, like the words of a book that's sealed. But perhaps most clearly, the scroll in Revelation 5 should bring us back to Daniel 12, where the Lord revealed that he would raise the dead on the last day to judge the wicked, to vindicate the righteous. What does he tell Daniel? Now's not the time. Shut up the words. Seal the book. Until the time of the end. In other words, this scroll that we find here in Revelation 5, this book reveals God's plan for the end. To break its seals is not merely to know what will happen, but to break its seals, to open the scroll, is to accomplish what's written inside. You can think about it this way. Uh, in the American Civil War, 150 years ago, uh, one, of, one of the army's generals had written his plans for battle on a piece of paper, and he had given it to one of his other generals, and that, that man had wrapped that paper over some cigars. Well, he forgot the cigars, and they went on their way, and they left the battle plan behind in camp. And the other army came, they found the scroll, they opened it. They didn't just read the scroll, right? They open the scroll, and what happened next? They start acting. They start doing in light of what was written in the scroll. The point I want to make here is when, when they're asking who's going to open the scroll, they're not just saying who's going to read what's inside. They're, they're saying who's going to read what's inside and bring it about. This scroll contains God's full and final prophetic word. When this scroll is opened, God will consummate his plan. He will fulfill his promise. The dead will be raised. The wicked will be judged. The righteous will be vindicated. The ruins will be restored. Creation will be renewed. God's blessed kingdom will come. To open this scroll, to break its seals, is to cause the seeds planted in Eden's garden to fully and finally bear fruit. All the attention in this vision is on this scroll. Now, I think one of the applications for us, church, is that we should yearn for the consummation. 
Shouldn't that be our heartbeat as Christians? I think about school children. For the end of the term, what's driving them? Holidays around the corner. I think about workers. They're younger. What's driving them? They're looking toward the weekend. If they're older, they're looking for retirement. I think even of, of some of my older members at my church, uh, we're, we're an older church than you are, I think. We've had two funerals in the last few months. Both funerals were of people who were so sick, so wasted by disease, they were just longing for death to be done with the pain. But as Christians, we don't just long for the holiday. We don't just long for retirement. We don't just long even for death. To be absent from the body, present with the Lord, right? Amen? That's a, that's a good thing. That's something we should long for. But there's something better we should long for. We should long for the consummation. We should long for the end. We should long for the day of our Lord's return. Isn't this what sustained the Apostle Paul, 2 Timothy? Coming toward the end of his life, what does he say? Henceforth, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day. And then listen to this. And not only to me, but also to all who have loved his appearing. We should be a people characterized not by hope in your next holiday, not by hope in the next Saturday you have off, but by hope in the consummation. But in order for that blessed day to come, God has appointed that someone must bring it about. Someone has to bring that day about. I, I wonder if you caught it when we were reading Joshua 8 earlier. If you read the book of Deuteronomy again and again, God through Moses tells the people of Israel, I'm giving you the land. I'm giving you the land. I'm giving you the land. But in order for Israel to inherit the land, who did they need? They needed a Joshua to lead them in battle, to live as a faithful son. All throughout the Old Testament, we get this promise, not only of the consummation, the end, but we also come to understand that we need a saving shepherd, a mighty warrior, a sovereign king, who by his wisdom, his goodness, his strength, breaks the seals, executes the plan, and shepherds us toward that blessed day. And so what happens next in this vision makes sense, doesn't it? Great angel goes forth from heaven's throne. He's, he's like a, a herald going forth from a great king to search for a champion. Look at verse 2. It's preaching this message. Who is worthy? It's the key word of this chapter. Who is worthy to open the scroll and to break its seals? Silence. Deep silence in heaven. Not a Nairobi silence. Learn staying here. There's no silence in Nairobi. So he's a dog that's barking, a rooster crowing, a radio booming. Not here though. Deep, complete silence. Because look at verse 3. Absolutely nobody was able. In heaven above, upon the earth below, not even under the earth, to open the scroll or to see inside it. No mighty angel above, no great man or woman upon the earth, not even a fearsome beast still hidden by the sea. No mere creature anywhere at any time is able to bring about God's promised end. The Jehovah's Witnesses want to argue that Jesus Christ is, is somehow the greatest creature. Somehow some, some lesser being than, than God, but some exalted creature. Revelation 5 says, no, then he wouldn't be worthy. No creature is worthy. No angel can raise the dead. No mere man can produce the promised inheritance. No beast from the depths can restore the ruins. Does not this silence in verse 3 expose the foolish pride of man? How many politicians have promised to do what no man can do? How many leaders, whether administrators or warriors, have assumed that they could master what no creature can master? 
How many philosophers have blindly sought what not even the angels in heaven can see? Man's pomp, man's arrogance adorns the walls of the Peace Memorial Museum. Quotations from men and women, Africans and Westerners, young and old, presuming that they know the path to lasting peace and telling us that we could achieve it if we would only listen to their words a little bit better. But Isaiah saw a day, did he not? Isaiah saw a day when the eyes of the arrogant shall be humbled, and the lofty pride of men shall be brought low, and the Lord alone would be exalted. The silence of verse 3 is the sledgehammer, the wrecking ball that demolishes human pride. We are not worthy to open the scroll. We are not able to make all things new. We are not the heroes or the champions of this story. And so look at verse 4. John starts weeping uncontrollably. He wept and mourned and wailed. Why? Because no champion, no consummation. No king, no kingdom. No savior, no salvation. This is what it looks like to long for the consummation. John longed for the consummation. And so when it looked like the consummation wouldn't come, he didn't shrug his shoulders and say, well, what's on TV? He wept. Imagine a child on the last day of school. The holiday's scheduled. Trip to the shore is planned. But there's nobody to pick him up. Nobody to take him home. He would weep. That's all he could do. With no one to open the scroll, God's end will never be fully revealed. Can you imagine if we didn't have revelation in our Bibles? With no one to break the seals, God's end will never be fully consummated. Now, let me just read you a few promises from the Bible about the end. 2 Corinthians 4, these light and momentary afflictions are producing for us an eternal weight of glory that far outweighs them all. Romans 8.18, for I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing to the glory that is to be revealed to us. Isaiah 25.8, and he will swallow up death forever. And the Lord God will wipe away tears from all faces, and the reproach of his people he will take away from the earth. 1 Peter 5, and after you have suffered for a little while, the God of all grace who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ, will himself restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. Then there's Revelation 21, verses 3 to 4. Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them, and they will be his people. And God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain any more, for the former things have passed away. Brothers and sisters, if there's no one to open the scroll, none of these promises come to pass. They are falling words, failing words, unless someone comes to open the scroll. Justice would never roll. Joy would never overtake us. The people of God would never inherit the promise. The dragon and the beastly kingdoms of man would never be subdued. So John's weeping makes sense, does it not? Because no champion has been found. No king has conquered. No savior has saved. So no end will come. And then... Like a light in the sun, bursting through the clouds, one of the elders speaks. Stop weeping, he commands. What's wrong with this elder? Is he impatient? Has he grown cynical from all his waiting? No. Stop weeping, he commands, because he has a gospel to proclaim. 
Good news to announce. Glad tidings to bring. Behold, the lion from Judah's tribe, who is the promised root of David, has conquered, so that he can open the scroll and its seven seals. This is gospel. The elder proclaims the promised king has conquered. The promised champion has triumphed. The promised savior has saved. I hope you see what this means about our God, brothers and sisters. He's not only the God who promises salvation, he's the God who provides the Savior. He's not only the God who promises the kingdom, he's the God who provides the king. He's not only the God who calls us to conquer, and that that is the, the call of this book for the Christian, is to overcome, to conquer, to persevere by faith. He is the God who provides the champion to lead us with certain victory in the battle. Many times in in hermeneutics, Bible interpretation courses, they love to talk about David and Goliath and say, you want to know a bad example of interpretation? You know, you're David, go kill your Goliath. Then the teacher will say, you're not David. Christ is David. That's true, right? Christ is the champion in the battle. But what happens after, through David, the Lord humbles Goliath and cuts off his head? Do you remember what happens? Philistines flee. And then the armies of Israel pick up their weapons and run after him. What Revelation 5 is telling us is that, yes, we must fight. But because our true and better David has conquered, we fight a defeated enemy. I hope you've noticed I've been using that word promised. It's from the description in verse 5. The lion from Judah's tribe. The root of David. These Old Testament titles reflect what God promised in the Old Testament about His Son. Israel's Messiah. The Gentile's Savior. The suffering servant. The exalted king who would crush the serpent. Demolish death. Conquer the nation, bring light to the Gentiles, and lead God's people in a greater exodus than Moses, and into a greater inheritance than Joshua. Verse 5 is gospel. Good news. Glad tidings. A joyous message of what God has done in His Son. So now for the first time since Revelation 4 verse 1, the the spotlight has been on the one who is sitting upon the throne and it, it shifted to the scroll in his hand, but it hasn't really left him. Now for the first time, spotlight is going to shift to someone new. We have heard of this hero. We have heard of this champion in the gospel of verse 5. Now we're about to meet him. Who is worthy? The mighty angel asked. Verses 6 to 14 proclaim the only answer. The lamb is worthy. Look to verses 6 to 10 with me. Read them again. And I looked and saw among the throne and the four living creatures and among the elders a lamb standing as one who has been slain or slaughtered. Possessing seven horns and seven eyes. These eyes are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. And he came. And he has received the scroll from the right hand of the one who is sitting upon the throne. And when he took the scroll, the four living creatures and the twenty-four elders fell down before the Lamb. Each holding a harp and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sing a new song saying, Worthy. Are you to take the scroll and to open its seals because you were slain? And by your blood you ransomed a people for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. And you have made them a kingdom and priests for our God and they shall reign upon the earth. In verse 5 we heard the gospel of Christ. Now in verse 6. This champion returns to heaven's throne and appears on the stage. But who John sees shocks us, doesn't it? We were downtown. We visited the IKCC, big building, 
circular top. Is that right? Something like that. There's a statue there, I think, of Jomo Kenyatta. Is that right? And man, it's an impressive statue. He's, he's sitting. He looks powerful. Looks like he's got authority. He looks like he's got wisdom. You know, we, we, we represent our founding fathers in the same way. Statues of George Washington. They're never statues of George Washington in his deathbed. It's always George Washington as a general on a horse. And the horse isn't just sitting there looking tired. It's rearing back. And Washington is in his general's uniform. He looks like a warrior. In Revelation 5.5, 5, we heard that we're about to meet the King of Kings, the mighty champion, the sovereign savior. But what symbol does John see? Not a founding father on his chair. Not a general on his horse. Look at verse 6. I saw a lamb. But not just a lamb. A slaughtered lamb. Living, though he appears to have been slain. What kind of symbol is this for a champion? Who does heaven's marketing? This is a sign of weakness. It's an emblem of defeat. What's going on here? But no, look at verse 6. This lamb, standing as though he had been slain, at the same time possesses seven horns and seven eyes. In other words, this slaughtered lamb, this symbol of weakness, possesses sovereign supremacy. That's what the horns represent, right? From the book of Daniel, horns are, are a symbol of the king. E even into uh, the book of 1 Samuel, when, when Hannah's prayer, exalting the horn of your anointed, it's a symbol of kingly strength. And this lamb who's living, though he appears to have been slaughtered, has seven horns to represent his almighty power, his absolute authority, his total control. And the seven eyes represent, we are told, the seven spirits, which as I said this morning, it's not seven different Holy Spirits. It's a symbol of the Holy Spirit in the fullness of his power. In other words, this lamb we are meeting in Revelation 5 verse 6 is the king of Isaiah 11.2. You remember the prophecy, don't you? The spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him. The spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. This lamb is that spirit-filled king. Now in Revelation 5-7, all of heaven is still and silent once more. The lamb who is slain approaches heaven's throne, receives the sealed scroll from the Father's right hand. And then in verse 8, like a key turning on a car, heaven's worship reignites. The four living creatures who represent all creation, the 24 elders who represent the people of God, even bearing our prayers before Almighty God, fall down once more, just as they did in chapter 4. But this time they're not fallen before the one who is sitting upon the throne. Look at the verse. They have fallen in worship in submission, in homage before this Lamb. So, so many scholars of the New Testament who think they're so smart want to argue that the New Testament doesn't demonstrate the deity of Jesus, the true deity of Jesus. There's a particular foolishness that you must have as a PhD in the New Testament to believe that. It's right here. In Revelation, you worship God. Here's the Lamb. Worshipped. They don't just fall down, they sing. Just like in Revelation 4, their song is about to tell us what all this vision means. What, what do you do with a slaughtered lamb with seven horns? How does that go together? Listen to their song. They sing like the Israelites on the Red Sea's shore. They sing like Jehoshaphat. And Jerusalem's host. They sing like David in Psalm 40. Drawn up from the pit. 
They sing a new and greater song for a new and greater salvation. And their song in verse 9 interprets this vision for us. Worthy, they declare. Worthy, they proclaim. Worthy, they shout. Is this Lamb the only one able and deserving to take the scroll from the Father's hand so that he might consummate the promised end? Why? How? He's a lamb. How do prey conquer? How do the slaughtered win? Why would the weak inherit? Such thinking is dragon-like venom that infects this world with its ideas of power. It's not for the church. It's not for the people of the crucified Christ. He is worthy. Look at verse 9. Because he was slaughtered, not in spite of it. He conquered, look at verse 9, by his blood, not without it. Weakness is the way. One of the reasons that this vision holds forth the way Christ conquered is to communicate to us the very path that was blazed by Christ. He conquered by a cross. First suffering, then glory. It's the same path we tread, brothers and sisters. We will overcome by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of our testimony, not by the strength of our arms, not by the zeal of our faith, not by the intelligence of our minds. Just as God promised, this Lamb suffered and died. Just as God decreed, he was captured and crucified. He came and did the will of his Father, saving God's elect by suffering for our sins, dying upon a cross, being put in a tomb. He is the suffering servant who began the end by his death. And therefore, because he's the suffering servant, who began the end, therefore heaven's song declares, he must be the exalted Lord who finishes the end by his life. So many of the gospel summaries, end of Luke, book of Acts, Peter, Paul, how do they summarize the work of Christ? Sufferings and then what? Glories. Sufferings and glories. He suffered and therefore Revelation 5, glory. It's just a symbolic representation of Philippians, is it not? He emptied himself by taking the form of a servant. He humbled himself by becoming obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Therefore, God exalted him and gave to him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bend in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, under the glory of God the Father. In church, do you see in verse 9 what his death accomplished? God's elect, God's beloved people, God's chosen people, not just from one nation or merely 12 tribes, but God's chosen people scattered among every nation, speaking every tongue, living all over during every time, in bondage to sin, lost in idolatry, divided by judgment, dominated by darkness and death. Verse 9 tells us, not anymore. The lamb was slaughtered, heaven sings in verse 9. And at the cost of his blood, he ransomed us such that we are no longer condemned by God, enslaved by sin, dominated by death, deceived by darkness, or divided from one another. And then he did, heaven sings, and tells us, this lamb did what even Moses could not do. He made us into one united kingdom that worships God and serves him in spirit and in truth as priests. We read from 1 Peter 2 earlier. We didn't get to verse 10. Remember what Peter says? Once we were not a people, because the lamb was slaughtered. Once we were not a people, 
But now, because the Lamb was slaughtered, we are the people of God. From every tribe, speaking every tongue, not contained by the boundaries of geography or the barriers of time. Genesis 15, the Lord takes Abraham out. I have no son, tells him. What's the Lord point him to? Look at the stars, Abraham. Count them if you can. So shall your offspring be. I have no patience for people who try to say that the doctrines of grace, that election, the sovereignty of God, definite atonement, give us a picture of God that he is unmerciful or something like that. It's because of God's sovereignty. It's because of his free love and election that there will be uncountable numbers of saints in the people of God rather than none. We will be as many as the stars in the sky. We will be as many as the grains of sand upon the seashore. What is the result of this Lamb's work who conquered by His cross, who liberated by His death, who ransomed us by His blood? Look at verse 10. We, not might, and we shall reign upon the earth. Brothers and sisters, Moses never entered the land. Joshua couldn't secure lasting rest. David's kingdom fell into ruin, but the Lamb, our champion, our hero, our King and Lord, has conquered by His cross. And with His victory, His victory, He has secured us for an inheritance. He has shared His inheritance with us. And He reigns now as our exalted Lord at the Father's right hand to bring about that promised end. That's Romans 8, isn't it? What shall we say in response to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare His own Son, but gave Him up for us all, how will He not also along with Him graciously give us all things? Who can bring any charge against God's elect? God is the one who justifies. Who can condemn? Then we come to Revelation 5. Christ Jesus is the one who died. More than that, who is raised, who is seated at the Father's right hand, who indeed is interceding for us. Who then shall separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord? This is gospel, good news of what God has done in His Son to fulfill what He promised about His Son, providing for us a certain salvation. Providing for the people of God salvation, a people from every tribe, speaking every tongue, whom the Father freely chose, whom the Son graciously saved, whom the Spirit powerfully seals. This is why we believe in the perseverance of the saints, not because my faith is strong enough, but because the Lamb has conquered and has taken the scroll and is at the Father's right hand. Revelation 5 is a symbolic vision of what happened in heaven after Acts 1-9 when Jesus, having been raised from the dead, went up into heaven to take up His throne. Here's what we need to understand from this vision, church. We live in a new world now. We live in a world where the promised King has come. We live in a world where the promised king has conquered. We live in a world where the promised king now reigns to bring about that promised end. It's already here. It's not here all the way yet. Embassies are still bombed. Dragons still deceive. Idolatry still tempts. Enemies still oppose. Afflictions still come. Grief still abounds. Death still devours. But the new world has already begun. The Savior has saved. The champion has conquered. Our King and Lord now reigns. What enemy shall ascend into heaven and threaten his throne? What power in all creation shall take the scroll from his right hand? 
How will death destroy the one who's holding the keys? Because Christ now reigns, the end will come. Because Christ possesses the scroll, every promise will be fulfilled. What's said at the end of Joshua will be said after Revelation 22. Not one word from all the good promises that God made to Israel failed. Every one was fulfilled. Because Christ has conquered, we will reign. How then should we respond? Worship. Wholehearted love. Life-giving service. Idolatry-defying loyalty. Unstoppable joy. Because the Lamb is worthy to take the scroll, to break its seals, to consummate its promises, He is with the Father, and unlike any mere creature in all creation, worthy of our worship. Look at verse 12. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. Children, I know you're on holiday, but how many worship words are there? It's a question. Count them. How many worship words? Power, wealth, wisdom, might, honor, glory, blessing. How many? Seven. Not an accident. It's the book of Revelation. The number seven represents fullness, completeness. Jesus Christ deserves the same worship that is given to the Father. Not one ounce less than what the Father Himself deserves from you, from me, from the church, from all creation. It's why, church, we can never agree with any man or woman, any religion or ideology that refuses to give Jesus the worship He is due. I think I'm right about this. I'm not sure. But from what I understand, in Vatican II, the Catholic Church told its members they don't need to evangelize Jews because they worship the same God as us. Revelation 5 says, no. Jesus Christ is worthy of their worship. Whatever religion they, it is that they are practicing, it is idolatry. Recent decades, missions, movements in the States wanted to say, Muslims and Christians, we worship the same God. You know, we just call them by different names. Revelation 5 says, no, no, Jesus deserves worship. So we will never make any peace with a, with a false religion like the Jehovah's Witnesses that refuses to worship Jesus as he deserves. Let me make two final applications. First to the unbeliever. The gospel reveals Jesus Christ. And I'm sure if you're here, you've heard of him. But I appeal to you. Do not trust your own wisdom. Do not trust what this world has told you about him. If you want to know what Kenya is like, you should go to Kenya, not Cameroon. We agreed on that? And so if you want to know who Jesus is and what he demands from you, you must not listen to your heart. Or to the foolish pride of man, you must listen to this book and to this gospel that runs like a vein of gold all throughout it. He is God's son, the true prophet who never lies, the fountainhead of the new creation who gives a life that death cannot take away, the king who reigns now to bring forth that promised kingdom. And you have two options. I quoted this on Friday, I'll quote it again, Psalm 2. Two options. When Jesus is revealed to you in the preaching of the gospel, two options with drastically different consequences. Kiss the Son. It's a symbol for worship. Worship the Son. Lest He be angry. And your way lead to your destruction. Because His wrath, His just anger, against your refusal to worship him, is quickly kindled. But on the other side, blessed are all 
whatever tribe you're from, whatever nation you're from, whatever language you speak, blessed are all who take refuge in him. Final application to the church. With the Father, our Lord Jesus Christ deserves all worship because he redeemed us by his death and now reigns to consummate God's plan. Brothers and sisters, this reality is what should drive evangelism. This reality is what should drive missions, even fearless missions to dangerous places. Not because we're looking for an adventure, not because we're, we're just supposed to do it. I've got to share the gospel because Pastor Morungi is going to ask me next Sunday if I shared it with my coworker. I better do it. No, we share the gospel with a fearless confidence because we long to see Jesus worshipped in more tongues than my own. Because we cannot be at peace when we see the worship he's due not being given to him. Because the worship that Jesus is currently receiving from the church all over the world isn't enough to honor him. He needs worship from every tribe, in every tongue, in every place. This zeal for his name is the fuel of faithful missions. Someone has said missions exist or evangelism exists because worship doesn't. And so the way to overcome fear and evangelism, faithlessness and missions, is not to just say do better. It's for the Spirit to reveal the glory of Christ to us, to captivate our hearts. Send us out. Let's pray. God, I am overcome by your mercy and generosity. What have we done that we deserve to share in this? What have we done that we deserve such a king, such a champion, such a hero? All that we have done suggests that we shouldn't have him. We are the wicked whose teeth ought to be broken by birth. And yet you have conquered us. Just as surely as your grace overwhelmed Paul, Christ has conquered us. He has been enthroned upon our hearts by the preaching of the gospel. And so we pray, O oh God, that he might now be exalted from our hearts and with our lives until he returns. And all creation joins together in exalting him. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.